Hi, this is Scott Park Phillips, and I'm here with Robert Allen Pittman, who doesn't really need an introduction for uh, people who've been in the martial arts world for decades. Um, but for the rest of you, I have his a link to his full bio below. I think uh, he's a difficult person to, inter to introduce, mainly because he is very broad and uh, dives into subjects that um, more conventional minds might not so easily dive. Uh, but he was studying Bagajang in Taiwan uh, and is one of the oldest living Bagua practitioners in the United States. Um, and of course uh, has a whole bunch of other realms of things, including time as bodyguard and uh, creating his own systems of uh, invention. And oh, we're gonna dive into a bunch of <laughs> stuff about the body, wisdom of the body it's called. Uh, we're gonna dive in a bunch of that stuff, um, but I'm also just gonna let this interview go where it goes. So welcome, Robert. Oh, thanks. Okay, well, uh, you you tip it off. You you dangle the carrot, and I'll chase it. <laughs> well, all right. So you you probably know a little bit about me. I've written a couple books, and I I I started with the. Uh, uh, I came across the premise early in um, my martial arts slash dance career that martial arts and dance were the same subject. Yeah. And for some strange reason, many cultures had separated them. And yeah. I, you know, there were a lot of puzzles, but I wanted to puzzle out the Chinese one. Yeah. And, and I don't know where this inform how this information came to me, you know, exactly. But okay. word out there was that, you know, Robert Allen Pittman makes the claim that Bagua Zhang is some kind of Shiva ritual. And I thought, and that definitely, I don't know exactly when I heard that. Yeah. You know, my own process. So I'm not sure how much to credit you as an original thinker yeah. in the realm. But yeah. um, like I might have been posing a bunch of ideas and other people said, oh, you know, Robert says that. Um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. clearly the pose, a classic Bagua pose with the foot in the air is yeah. uh, very um is the Shiva pose. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, having studied Indian classical dance myself very seriously oh. for six years in my 20s. Where were you? I was in San Francisco. Of okay. course, who, was, studied, the, who, was, who was your teacher? Chitresh Das. Okay. All right. And which which style of dance was it? Katak. Okay. So have you got a sense of rhythm or what? I... <laughs> no, I <ain't laughs> you know... Well, that we didn't we we had a little uh, loose connection at the beginning here, like it, it wasn't working. So I just went out and drummed for forty five minutes. Um, yeah, but yeah, drumming uh, drumming has been a part of my life since my twenties, pretty pretty consistently. And I've been learning Ghanaian drum, yeah. drum, the drumming of Ghana lately. That's okay. Really cool. Robert Amaker is a man that you should try to get bio on. He passed away a couple of years ago. He studied, he's a Tai Chi, he was, he was a Tai Chi teacher. He left the uh, White Crow School of Tai Chi in Moscow and Prague. But one of his adventures was to go to Tuva. And when they heard him drum, they said, we hear the voice of our ancestors, stay here. And they made yeah. him sit in the museum for three days and drum while the men came out of the mountains to come and be healed. Wow. Um, and he had studied... Uh, just a tabla in California from the from a, as a teenager with an Indian teacher for I think oh, oh maybe a dozen years or so and ended up with an African teacher for many years and then he pulled them and so it he used the big hoop skin drum uh, but whenever he drummed I always had the impression there was five people in the room drumming not one he he was that good 
Uh, his Tai Chi was also pretty extraordinary. His, uh, he has a couple of senior students. His daughter teaches in, uh, I think, Mill Valley uh, with uh, Scott. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, Tom Maxson is the guy that uh -huh. his daughter, Aleska or Alessia Amaker. But the reason I bring him up is because of this deep, deep connection of the heart to the drum and the drum to martial arts and martial arts to stepping stepping to constellation and constellation to ritual to poetry so there, there's this whole stream that you and i can talk about as a sort of common language one of the fastest ways to learn something is to make it rhyme or to sing it or to stamp it out so with your feet um so or to just synchronize it with something that's familiar yeah, absolutely. And and really the whole idea of Bagua as a concept is a kind of uh, Italian memory palace. In other words, you imagine you have a room that you walk in mm -hmm. and there are shelves and desks and everything you've ever learned, you deposit there in your memory. So if you need it, you enter the imaginary room and you take what you need. And then this way you you basically maintain your memory of everything you've learned. You, you Bob, know, Bob, that's Bob, to precisely, me to... I just wanted to interrupt. That is precisely how I learned it. I just want to say that I, you know, it, the, the problem is, is, is finding students who, who are dedicated enough to get it by that method, because it means you have to really, really practice a lot, you know? Yeah. Keep yeah. Going. This is, this is an etheric body thing. And when I say etheric body, I'm talking about the heartbeat and the cycles of lung respiration. We, we learn things through uh, patterning and our breathing and rhythm. And the Chinese really like that. They love repetition. And I would swear their bodies have been genetically altered through their millennia to to emulate certain positions with ease and it has something to do with uh their fearlessness about repetition Ten thousand times they don't care ten they do ten thousand you know come back see me later and you know robert smith was my first bagua teacher and for all his qualms he was very asiatic in his idea that you have to have loads of repetition just thousands of times you know he would say do this and he'd walk away and smoke his cigar and come back you know and so this idea of repetition it falls by the wayside when you're looking at application because application is the quick way it's like commandos learning things in two weeks if he does that you do this but when you add the recipe of you're going to do this 500 times and then or a thousand and then you're going to learn an application you're seasoning a movement with tactile memory and then it becomes uh like a thing you know it becomes like its own entity and that that protocol that we're discussing the relationship of repetition and rhythm to memory and mem memory to body that's starting to be a missing element because because most young people don't understand why they should do it so many times because they live in a push button world. So, you know, it's a, my you know, first Shaolin teacher. Yeah. Right? So, so my, my first teacher was Bing Gong and he, he was a disciple of, of Guo Lin Ying, who was, yeah, a, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. People, I remember, I know his name very back. well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and Bing, so I started studying with Bing when I was 10 and is, this, uh, is he still alive? Yes. Yeah. He is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's old. Uh, and uh, uh, let me and, close this window. I got a, a leaf blower. Hang on. Yeah, sure. I can't hear it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay, good. That's better. Um, anyway, yeah. So, so I started doing Northern Shaolin, right? And that was it. There was no application. It was just this, you know, and, and as a 10 year old, I didn't mind. It was also the hippie era. I didn't know anything about martial arts it was that was you know it was just presented empty really truly yeah. empty. and yeah. and so you know as 
later on, he did start to teach me some application stuff. I also learned later on when I was, I stopped, right? In my teenage years, I was doing other stuff. I was yeah. a skateboarder, really. Um, yeah. And, Dude, and, okay. and then yeah. I became a dancer and then I went back to martial arts and I, and I was studying with yeah. him and, and he was yeah. teaching me Wang Shen's eyes material and Taiji. Um, yeah. But the Shaolin, yeah. you know, I kept it and, and I, uh, it, when I eventually studied with other people and I started to learn applications, it it really changed it. It really did. But having had that that repetition without any application is so rare these days, and it was mm -hmm. so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it teaches you mirroring protocol. Monkey see, monkey do, and you know. Short term, you could say, well, that's not going to teach you how to fight. Well, it's real interesting because you learn to read bodies. And you learn to do something really interesting, which is copy a position. And this brings up one of my more favorite topics that I think most practitioners uh, don't discuss. How, how conscious they are of it, I don't know. But it's the barrel receptors, the proprioceptors, through all the receptors in the body that actually wrap you up in an identity mm -hmm. uh, which means if you can do the same kind of body movement someone else can you can feel some of the stuff they feel mm -hmm. now that becomes self-defense because mm -hmm. that gives you the ability to predict aggression mm -hmm. you can see posture you can see aggressive posture you can sense it you can smell it mm -hmm. but that's well before the contact point where you need the hands-on stuff yeah, I, it, that's an interesting thing, you know, uh, and, and something that, you know, I I don't know how deep we'll get into this particular material, but it's, it's good material if we're, because you obviously are very interested in how people learn, right? And oh, sure. Yeah. As a dancer, I, you know, I, you know, it's copying people's, it's it's copying people's movement. You're really, it's it's different, It's but it's not that different than, you know, mm -hmm. we're just talking teaching styles. but. Yeah. Um, some dance teachers, I could get their body in my body, right? Yeah. I could just yeah. do that. And then like, oh, I'm doing your body. And like, you can follow them. Then that's really easy to just follow them because you're like, but also, and it, it was weird too, because it didn't really matter if they were big or small. It did sometimes matter their shape. Mm -hmm. But I remember. Yeah. Yes. There's some teachers. Uh, in my case, Robert Smith, I, he had a very different body, so I could never move like him. But but later in Taiwan with Hung, I could move like him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was small and slender, and I'm not a big guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't move like a, a husky judaka, mm -hmm. you know. So what you're saying, the body type really does uh, figure into this quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> And that's yeah. something that there's so much, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, it's one of those puzzles, you know, like, like, um, in a really open environment, everyone would share, be sharing students with each other because like, okay, this kind of thing you should learn from that. You should learn from that type of person, right? That there's this, the individuals have a type of appetite and a nature that matches yeah. up with teachers that's right phenomenal. this is all about this is all about the uh the art of assessment how do you assess a student mm -hmm. yeah and the old chinese teachers who were not involved in starting their own cult uh the ones who were really interested in the student blossoming as an individual and there were those in this weird juxtaposition and panorama of uh uh, cult, dance, temple, mafia, outlaw, knight errant. In in that whole panorama of, uh, I want to call it the Chinese watercolor of medieval iniquity, you know, that whole thing, um, there were actually a few altruistic people who were trying to uh, uh, try to really bring the student to their own potential. And they did share students, and they do crop up in some of the wuxia uh, novels, some of the knight errant books and stuff. But it's rare because most of the, the the tribe instinct leaks into everything. We do it this way, and you know 
we protect our own and I understand all that. And that is an instinctive thing, but if you believe that your student could become something greater than yourself, you have to have a different view of what your what the student is there for you to teach. You know, that's a very different thing. Yeah. Is, yeah, I you know, I have this uh <laughs> I have this, uh, I would claim it's Taoist, but it's, uh, uh, it's surprising how unusual it is. I, 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 what I tell students, if there's students, you're working with a new student, mm -hmm. but this is true of me working with any student, right? If you're yeah. working with another student, but your goal should be to make them stronger, smarter, yeah. richer, yeah. funnier, and better true. looking. Yeah. <laughs> I, think those are, I think those are all great objectives. And if you don't have those objectives, then to me, what happens is it defaults to something you're not aware of. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like paranoia or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you, you know, you know, you become the, the that Chingy guy who killed forty people, and then he was having dinner in a little cafe, and someone walked in, and he thought they were attacking him, and he jumped to the side and hit his head on an iron table and died. It's because he was paranoid. See. So all that training uh, for combat or for whatever it is you think you're doing, it can really spin into a psychosis if you don't consciously create targets for yourself. I'm doing this because you know, I'm doing this because. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, I will say this just to see where it takes you. Um, uh, I... One of the things I noticed, I actually, uh, working with Rory Miller pushed a lot of these buttons. Um, I, I I know of his books. I don't know him, but his books are really right on the mark. Yeah, and it 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 um it got me thinking about like okay, so um the adrenalized state, you know, is different. You know, if you're adrenalized, you're you're uh, all of your there's all sorts of stuff that doesn't work. And there's all sorts of stuff that you don't need to train. Like there, the, the game really flips. Like you don't need to be stronger if you're adrenalized because you're going to be strong. Mm -hmm. You're going to be really strong and you don't need to be faster. Right. Those sorts of that kind of thing ch changes. It's, yeah. it's value changes. Um, yeah. On the other hand, a small elaborate techniques or multi-step techniques, things like that. Those things fall away when you're adrenalized because you, you, God, have a kind of clumsiness. Um, yeah, it, it becomes what was it? Someone said you just lump. They said you just do. Do you articulate it, or do you just sort of lump along? That's what right. Daniel Marat right. said to me. He's another guy you should talk to. Um, and cool. uh, yeah, but and, but, you know, uh, and your and your vision narrows, right? So there's all these things. Yeah. So I st I took that sort of data set, like what happens when you're adrenalized, and I started looking at dance, and I and I started to realize. What like because I already knew like I knew and I say this um, somatically I knew somatically that these dance patterns and these martial arts patterns were very often identical like in my body and so but other people couldn't see them so I said what so for instance the waltz you know yeah it the waltz is it is a beautifully designed martial art for. Mm -hmm connecting with someone's center of mass and moving yeah. them. And if someone has taken your center of mass, taking it back um, for yeah, drop steps, right. for rhythmic drop steps and, 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 um, and up steps, which unbalance people. And also for, for, for breaking the freeze, the patterns of turning yeah. your head left and right while you're spinning, those yeah. kinds of things are, but you know, it's not, it's not a cage combat it's not that <laughs> no no it's not cage combat but in the uh i want to call say in the highly ergonomic animal world mm -hmm. it gives you your primary skills of contact because the waltz really sets you up for the sayanagi the sleeper hold mm -hmm. and uh you know the hip throw the shoulder throw uh you've got hand contact you got body contact it you're in range of head but uh, you've got all the Even winding, yeah. Even just all the winding yeah. yeah. So a lot of people, they just don't see the commonality We're we're really taught not to see how things connect. And our education is, has, 
has made us create false boundaries between objects. And this has not been very helpful for an evolving humanity because it, it literally gives you the habit of clicking in your mind from one thing to another without seeing any overlap. I, I can see why Rudolf Steiner insisted everybody do watercolor so they could see how one color bled into another uh -huh. page. Because this is the way I look at dance and martial arts. One thing sim simply bleeds or overlaps into another, and then you have a, a position or a movement that I would call an archetype. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is normally, if the movement is really archetypal, it's, it works as dance and martial arts. Um, and the audience recognizes it. It's, it's reflexive. Uh, and there's a huge amount of that in what in what's in India. And I, I think Indian dance probably has the greatest collated archetypal posture systems uh, compared to some of the other uh, countries. They've got bigger catalogs like, you know, the 210 mudras or whatever they have for the hand. Oh, well, certainly if you look at, if you're looking at all the different classical dances, right? Because they're, yeah. they're regional, but like, yeah, Katakali obviously yeah. has a whole, entire language. And the reconstructed Odyssey is very interesting. Mm -hmm. What they've done with that is incredible. So anyway, yeah. So I'm interested in this common, common language of the body. Uh, what Daniel Marat's called the dancing word. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a common expression through the body, whatever nationality we recognize, threat, fear, courage, love, embrace, extension, feeling of space, uh, range of movement. All these things have emotional components. We just live in such a disembodied society that's projected onto chalkboard screens and concepts that we have to really re-inviscerate. Re, uh, uh, we got to almost have to re reboot the nervous system uh, because children, you know, are rapidly becoming disassociative. As soon as they get that luminous screen in their hand, they disassociate. Um, this, when, the, when they write on the chalkboard, this is an apple, and they draw a picture of the apple, and then you look at it, and they say apple, and you say apple, and it's not an apple. It's a picture of an apple. It's a concept. And that just splits all the way 12 grades up into university and you live entirely in these things in your head, unless you get physical. You know, if you punctuate that with uh, fly fishing or uh, uh, tree climbing or, or something where you can, you know, use your actual senses, then you become very different. Education doesn't tend to. I, I, I want to come back because, because there is a very there's a, there's an important issue, but I think I, I, what I'd like to do for a moment is is cover some of your experience uh, in yeah. Taiwan and then also what you were doing in in in, in uh, or in France or in Brittany or somewhere. Yeah, else. yeah, I lived in Brittany. I have good friends there, good students. All right, so so let me so let me ask some questions. So, well, what year did you first get to Taiwan? What was that? When you were uh, 1982. I did Taekwondo when I was 12 mm -hmm. and uh, when, and I found Robert Smith's book. It took me a couple of years to locate him because you had to write letters to publishers. So mm -hmm. I started with him. My friend Danny reminded me, I used to say 1975, but it was actually 1976 mm -hmm. and I was 15. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had a learner's license. I didn't have a driver's license. My friend Danny was five years older. He drove me up to Washington. And I started doing Bagua in Robert Smith's classes. And then he insisted I learn the short Yang Taiji form. And I hated it, but he insisted. Mm -hmm. And I started picking up his Xing Yi. And he was uh, big on reps and big on discipline. Mm -hmm. And a difficult person in many ways with a great sense of humor and a, a bright mind. Uh, he was a CIA operative. He was were, a specialist in Russian language. Were, he was a specialist in Russian. So w were you with him in, in Taiwan at no. all? No. No. Oh. By, by the time I went to Taiwan, he was in Taiwan from 59 to 64. I was born in 59. So I met I met him in, uh, around, let's see, 1975, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, 
he had no contacts there. Uh, my friend Danny Emery uh, had gone to Taiwan to study Tai Chi with, with Joe Manching's chief student there, uh, Mr. Leo. And Danny oh. said, why don't you come over to Taiwan? And I said, uh, I'd like to study with Wong Su Chin. Mm -hmm. And Wong Su Chin died about three months before I left. And so I said to Danny, well, do you know of any other Bagua teachers? He said, no, I don't know anybody, but come on over, we'll find somebody. So basically I went over, he had an English teaching job set for me and uh, a room in a dormitory at a university. So I went there, I started teaching English part-time and visiting the Taiji groups with Danny and uh, Marnix Wells, mm -hmm. who's an old Chinese scholar in, in Britain. And Marnix helped me a lot because he had lived there for about 10 years as the head of a shipping company and he knew the culture mm -hmm. and had studied with Hung Yishong and uh, other Chinese teachers. So one thing led to another and I ended up finding Hung Yimin, that could turn into a story but he didn't have a commercial school, but he accepted me as a, as his student. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had class, I studied with him every morning with three or four other people. There was a tiny class in a park. It wasn't a formal public forum. It wasn't a school, mm -hmm. uh, but I was with him for uh, 1982. I came back in 83. All he taught me that first year, and he he knew damn well I'd come from Robert Smith, and I wanted to learn the circling exercise of Bagua, but when I told him I couldn't fight my way out of a paper bag, he said, well, we need to work on fighting because you've been with Shir Shenzhong. Robert, that was Robert Smith's Chinese name. He said, you've been with Shir Shenzhong for seven years. You need to know how to do something. So he, he basically just drilled me in the, the 64 linear tactical patterns uh, hands-on for a year. Mm -hmm. And every movement was an application. So I actually learned all those forms as a string of applications hands-on. So that was painful and informative. Mm -hmm. um, and that really woke up my PTSD, uh, <laughs> as well as living in Taipei, which was pretty rough. It was hard at that time? Um, uh, it was for me because um, I... Um, I'm going to close this door because I'm doing the interview. Boy, the cat hysterics. Anyway, uh, yeah, okay. I was teaching English and living in a, in a dorm some of the time. And uh, I was uh, teaching English to make enough money to study English full time to get a visa so that I could study with Hung in the mornings because I wasn't doing Tai Chi. I couldn't get a visa extension. I was, was he, doing something more arcane. Was he speaking, was he speaking um, Mandarin or? or No, he was yeah. speaking Taiwanese. Yeah. And so between my bad Mandarin and his Taiwanese, it, it wasn't easy except that it was all hands-on. Sure. And he knew bits of Mandarin. So, as bad as my Mandarin was, his was equally bad. And we got along fine on that respect. Um, that was a that was a very, very intense year for me. And uh, it's very hot. And uh, there wasn't always air conditioning where I was living. And Taipei is an extremely polluted. It was extremely polluted. I used to wash my face at night and pull the black tar out of my eyes from the fumes. Sure. Sure. It was just really a pollute. The sewers were open and I wasn't living out in the countryside. I was living in the city and we'd go down to the river where the old Chinese junks used to come in and drop, drop off uh, cargo. And uh, that river was old and sulfurous and we would meet in a little temple by the river. And I thought, damn, you know, it stinks. And uh, that was it. And his old friends would meet him there from the war, and they'd have tea, and we'd train together. What kind of what kind of temple was it? Probably one of these typical um, syncretic temples. In other words, they're probably something like an Iguandao temple. Uh -huh. There was an sure. There was a deity, and there was a red lamp, and there was incense, and then there were outdoor tables, and people would come there in the early morning to 
sit, either sit by the river and do qigong or do standing qigong or there were several guys doing movements along the river in the early morning mm -hmm. uh you know they'd get there at pre-dawn before because it, it would get really hot once the sun was up so people would get down by the river as early as four or five o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and be gone by uh eight mm -hmm. you know uh but my my time with hung was uh the first year it was only for an hour in the morning i would get there at about 7 30 we'd go to late 30 or 9 and then i'd get on the bus and go into town and teach i'd have to start off stop at the hotel to change clothes mm -hmm. in the bathroom and then make my way to uh, chinese class and then later in the day english class it was rigorous yeah 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 Plain i i know i i i i had heat stroke in <laughs> taipei <laughs> it's it's easy to do it's easy to do. it's also noisy as hell and i I had not realized that I has how spoiled a suburban life I had had growing up. Uh, it's wall to wall noise, traffic, low flying aircraft, pollution. Well, so but I have a I have a couple I have a couple questions that I just want to pose. And you might not have answers to them, but I just want to Go throw ahead. them out there real quick. So, what was Robert Smith actually doing in Taiwan? Do you know? Yeah, he was an economic advisor to Shanghai Shek. So. What happened in the revolution, as you probably know, is the Kuomintang failed to conquer Mao Zedong, so they fled to Taiwan. So what we're taught in that fleeing to Taiwan is they took the island by force, mm -hmm. which means they've lined everybody up in the train station and machine gunned them and took the government of the island. That was yeah. the CIA. Yeah. Uh, Robert Smith went over uh, as an advisor to Chiang Kai-shek and sometimes known as cash my check by the GIs. And uh, he was the economic advisor, which means he would do the evaluative studies for potential uh, growth and wealth in different economic areas. Uh, I'll give you an example. Although I was only a teenager, sometimes <clears throat> uh, he would talk to me about things or I would see things in his house or whatever. And he he was an intelligence gathering guy. So what that means is he would look at how fast they were laying down rail lines in mainland China. <clears throat> and he would calculate the economic growth that would result from the creation of a train line across a certain portion uh -huh. of the country. Uh -huh. Then he would report that back to the government. So he was calculating ec economic trends and transport and technological development large scale uh, for things in mainland China to Chiang Kai-shek's group, apparently. But he was also apparently involved in supervising their economic development, mm -hmm. what to develop first, how fast, and in what manner. Now, there's two kinds of economists, you know, one with a clipboard and one with a clipboard and a gun. And he was one with a clipboard and a gun. So if you want to get a picture of that, you have to read Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar. Okay, so that's the John Perkins side of Robert Smith. So he had both aspects going, and the thing is, as an old judo guy, he was also very fascinated by Chinese martial arts. Now, because of that, and because he had, had days off, you know, he had like two maids, the, the family lived in Tenmu in a nice district, they had servants, mm -hmm. uh, and he had spare time. He was able to do a lot. And he also had very able translators and photographers. Sure. So because of that, he was able to get around the island. And being who he was, uh, they felt obligated to show him stuff because he was the guy basically bringing money. Mm -hmm. Right? To the, whole, to the whole country, yeah. Yeah, and also there was an intimidation factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, if you watch the films uh, that... I think they're at Texas A&M now, his old films. A few have gotten onto YouTube, but most of his work is deposited at Texas A&M. He had given me several boxes of material, but I returned them before he could blackmail me. But that's <laughs> another story. Uh, he's a very cagey character. Uh, um, but anyway, 
his films, you see these guys lining up and bowing in front of the camera before they demonstrate things. And I realized in a lot of ways, these men were under duress. Uh -huh. Here's this big intimidating government guy who comes in with daddy Warbucks and the U S bonds, and mm -hmm. they've got to line up and obey. But there were, there were quite a few men who didn't like him. Uh, and he, uh, he wrote his books, you know, from that four years of experience and then training. And he sort he took the economic point of view, which means he was very quick to assess things and make snap judgments. And I think he failed in a lot of ways in that respect, because he came in with a kind of superiority complex, uh, which tints his writing. Mm -hmm. His writing is always self-referential. Self mm -hmm. But in spite of that, you can see a lot in it. He had a poetic flair. His his writing is fascinating. The people he describes are fascinating, but he never really quite gets you inside the door because he wants to be the door. And that's the way his writing is organized. So when you read it, you're always left, well, boy, what a great experience he had. And think, there, there's do no way. Knew, do you think he knew Hillary de, de Barriere? I don't know. Who is that? Oh, I just thought you might know. He, he is famous for his book on on uh, Vietnam background to betrayal. Uh, what year? What year? He published in sixty five. So um, they probably older. Did. Yeah, well, you know, he was very anti Vietnam, uh -huh. very anti Vietnam, and he said the CIA advised against it, mm -hmm. and they went in anyway. And of course, later they found out they lied, and there was no Tonkin incident. Uh, all that's turned into a farce, 12 years of bloodshed. But, oh, uh, th this book is about the, all the stuff that happened before that. Um, with the French. With with the French. And yeah, this guy, this uh, de Barrier um, was friends with the, the, the king. Yeah. And and uh, so, we, you know, it was a translator and and, uh, and the CIA initially was funding um, Ho Chi Minh. Yes, oh. absolutely. Yeah, who also did Taiji? Uh, <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, no, but it, it, that's it, you know, it's that would be amazing to figure out if they ever corresponded, if there was any letters it's or anything. A, it's a very Graham Greene phenomenon. I don't know if you if you know if you read The Quiet American, but yeah, yeah, that's a, that's kind of the, the to me that's the best representation of of how the CIA works. Uh, unfortunately, um, The Quiet American was made into a film and it was blacklisted and taken out of the theaters as soon as it appeared. Uh, Michael Caine said it was the best performance he ever gave. Interesting. Uh, and if you want, to know, if you want to know think... about the, the, the overlap, uh, French and American into Vietnam, uh, well, read Graham Greene because he, he wrote the book and he he was the witness and he was a British operations intelligence guy. Mm -hmm. And he wrote beautifully as a lot of them did. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys were hired into intelligence because they could write, because the reports could capture the difficulties. Mm -hmm. Robert Smith told me he was hired because he could write. Mm -hmm. uh, but he came in on the GI Bill after being a Marine. Mm -hmm. So they had tracked him from the orphanage. So that's a whole other tale he was a, he was in boys town he was in orphanage from the age of four and uh um the uh the cia watched the orphanages because those are children with little to no loyalty so when they farmed out of boys town they got robert smith and they got the oldest boy at the orphanage who was like the hero of all the younger kids and he became the cia handler for all the kids, the younger ones under him when they were imported into the CIA. Where where was Boys Town? Where where? I think it's in Iowa. Uh -huh. Or yeah, I have to double check. Uh huh. But interesting. Robert Smith was born in Iowa, so yeah, I uh -huh. think it's. Wow. You can you can look it up. So that's that whole thing about the orphanage and uh, the CIA keeping an eye on them and going into the Marines and then coming back and going into the agency and going to the University of Washington on the GI Bill. And getting a, I think he had an MA in history. He was good on uh, Serbo Croatia. He did his PhD on the Serbo Croatian, the mass exodus and extermination and all that. Stalin, the whole monster of the whole Stalin monster, that was something he knew a lot about. Mm -hmm. 
and he would he would direct me to read George Kennan, uh -huh. so I would understand Russia. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah he would say, "Alan, if you want Russia, you need to read Kennan." Um, so because he was so literate, you know, the way I learned Bagua from him was midst this plethora of uh, a rich intellectual literature. Mm -hmm. He loved literature. He loved books. He had a library in his house in Bethesda because it's basically a spy enclave has all the greatest old bookshops because the, the spooks, they want to know what they're doing before they go in. And so they read up on it. And a lot of them are very erudite, mm -hmm. extremely erudite people. And so, you know, as a young kid from the South with a British mother and an American father, it was interesting for me to end up in Bethesda learning from a spook with, you know, in Spookville with all these very literate, savvy people who were interested in the underbelly of everything. Uh, so that was pretty heavy medicine for a 15 year old, mm -hmm. you know, and I was with him till I was 40. So that's a lot of years of Spookville that I never joined. And he, he groomed me basically to join. And he was, I'm sure pretty pissed off. I didn't. And that had a lot to do with our separation, mm -hmm. but he was also a remarkable character but not necessarily a nice person, which is what he would say about Jim Manching, by the way. Uh, <laughs> remarkable character, not a very nice person. Oh, I could see that the, this conversation, I, you know, I've seen a few, not, not, you haven't done a huge number of interviews where I, I can tell I've seen a few and I, and they're all very different, you know, like you, cause you have these rabbit holes you can go down and, yeah. I, and I realize I could dig more there. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to leave that for a moment and take you back to Taiwan for a moment. Yeah, and sure. Ask you, like, what? Um, uh, actually, here's how I'm going to ask the question. So I just sent a student to Taiwan. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's a missionary who's uh, raised in Taiwan, and she's you know speaks. Uh, you know, she's she teaches literature at the university, yeah. right? Wow. Um, yeah. And and. Uh, and or, you know, her parents were missionaries. Um, and and uh, and and I was just hearing about someone else who just went there, and it's like you know, it's, and and the shock. Um, there's no other place really like Taiwan. You can go to Singapore, and you can wander around. You can find the really Chinese parts, but of course they're mixed, right? Mm. There's all this yeah. India, um, yeah, and, and Malaysia mix thing going on. So you're not. You wouldn't be completely sure what's Chinese, right? And you yeah. could go to Hong Kong, and it's a different culture. It's also this massive city, so like crazy, you know, it, yeah, it's crazy, certainly... crazy modern juxtaposition. Yeah, and and old British Empire too. Hong Kong very and old that too, right? So, yeah. but you're in Taiwan. It's like okay, this is Chinese culture. Like wow, and it's so different than mainland China, um, visually. Mm. I would just say visually is the biggest phenomenon like that, that, that there's this religion going on all over the place. Yeah. And there have been a bunch of revivals. So like a I time don't, warp. what's that? It's like a time warp. Yeah. Right. And there've yeah. been a bunch of revivals, but there's stuff that is, that's less now that was more than, uh, for instance, um, the trans medium thing has, you know, come in and out the, 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 uh, yeah. supposedly there's more, um, body um, cutting yeah. now, yeah. now yeah. body modification, more, more, self mortification, they call it. Yeah. A little yeah, bit yeah. more of that now than there was, say, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but um, I mean, how, what was that like for you? How did that, the religious culture, affect you while you're, uh, and I, yeah, uh, let's leave that there. Uh, well, what I, what I got, the little that I, that I got of that was, I could you could go down an alley in the early morning and you could hear them hitting the wooden block duck, 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 and chanting I, uh, yeah, oh, almost like Native American yeah smell in the incense and you know maybe the paper lanterns were still glowing and you're going down this dark alley it's like something out of a spectral kind of dreaming world Mm -hmm. And you think, wow, people do this shit. People live in this atmosphere. Mm 
And I had been raised in a, a conservative small church, and I understood about rich a little bit about ritual, but not not to the Roman Catholic level. Mm -hmm. But I, it was it had an eerie quality. Uh, going to the Confucian temple and seeing all the incense and the urns and standing before the, uh, uh, the the tablets with the names of the ancestors on it and not worshiping. This is how the, how the Christian missionaries really fucked it up. They don't worship anything. They stand in front of the tablet and they remember where they came from. Uh, and the smart missionaries figured that out. But anyway, um, the whole missionary thing is a whole fascinating subject. My great uncle was a missionary right behind Livingston in Africa. So I, I, I got that thing. Behind yeah, Livingston? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the China thing, yes, the atmosphere and there were still a few rickshaws around. Uh, and you saw these tiny, almost anorexically muscular guys pulling a rickshaw with some fat guy. And you're thinking, damn, that's what he does for his life, his living. And I remembered Bruce Lee talking about making a movie in Hong Kong and they didn't have steel round bars for the jail cell scene. And so they got square ones and they sanded them round. And I thought, wow, that is what you call a lot of free labor and time. And living in Taiwan, I began to realize, look, these people, some of them are so poor, they have learned to make do with anything and turn anything into something else. Mm -hmm. You realized what it was like to be dirt poor. Mm -hmm. And then you saw, of course, the limousines and people in BMWs and Rolls Royces. And you realized, oh, well, there does seem to be some vast wealth from some mysterious location on the island. There was the geography of the island, which is reminded me of Hawaii, uh, but the city, you know, vastly polluted, uh, countryside gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I went down to the tip of the island once and we visited a Confucian temple and I think a couple of others to see all that intact and monks are there and doing their thing like a timeless protocol. And you walk into it and you feel the timelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the little tiny piece of China that didn't bend the language. They, the language didn't go through metamorphosis in Taiwan. They kept the older Chinese completely intact. All the books, they're in the older Qing dynasty characters. The people, when they think of communism, you know, they're, they realize that they're the ones that kept the old stuff. I don't know if you know this, the, um, the, the Beijing Imperial Museum was loaded up on two barges and floated down the coast during the revolution to Taiwan, and that is their museum. Beijing it's, doesn't have that stuff. It's the most spectacular museum. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I, and they rotate, it, for people who I do know, for people who, who don't know, they, they have a rotating exhibit because yeah. they, it's such a vast collection. So anytime, anytime you're in Taiwan, go to the museum you're going to see new stuff yeah. um it's spectacular absolutely, absolutely it's, spectacular yeah and so that you know that revolution thing that brought mainlanders into taiwan that, that made taiwan like the refrigerator of preservation there's a lot of old bits of china in taiwan that did not survive the revolution in the mainland but the mainland is trying to reclaim everything because of the tourist industry. Yeah, Look, the mainland I, has an incredible geography, but they struggle with what they did to themselves. I, you know, I, I, I you, know, you know, obviously I'm going to send you my, my, my books. My second book, I, I really lay out that, you know, a half a million temples were closed in mainland China. Half a million. Yeah. If, if, if not burned. Yeah, closed. Just the what the what was being practiced there was ended. Yeah, they right. went into cave. They went into the cave hermits and lit them on fire in the Cultural Revolution. But but yeah. before by be, by 1940, right before Chiang Kai Shek left, yeah. half a million temples had been closed. Yeah. So so when they got when 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 the Guomindang got to Taiwan, it was already a preservation of something that had been destroyed. Yeah. That's why Chen Pen Ling and these other martial arts guys got very interested in condensing systems. 
because they felt like there were too many elaborate details that were begging the question. So he condensed Chinese boxing into a curriculum or mm-hmm. tried to. Mm-hmm. He was also very modern about application and science mm-hmm. and evolving it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there were men who knew that they had something precious as far as a relic of culture. And they were trying to uh, reduce it to manageable proportions to pass to students who themselves were at the tail end of a preservation campaign, you know. And, and so, so, you know, I, I got a sense of this, right? Yeah. From my, from my, from my teachers. Um, and, I, and I'm the kind of person, for whatever reason, that that had extraordinary natural discipline, like yeah. the, just repeat it. I just stepped into that world. It's like, yep, I'll do it 10,000 times. I, it sounds fun to me. Like, and I don't that, And believe me, that would win, win their hearts because they had a willing student who would simply do what they said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. had, so I had this like, and, and that's just, I don't know if it's genetic or just a character flaw or what, but I, you know, I had that. So um, when I, um, when I started, it w- what happened to me is, is that in in about um, I started dancing, right? I started. I was an exchange student in Australia, and I and I started dancing there because I was looking for people with more energy, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I came back to San Francisco, and the men were dying of AIDS. Like all the men were dying of AIDS. It was wild in the dance world, and yeah. um, and so I. You know, I started, but I started getting into dance, which was a great time to be a young male dancer because they needed men for everything. So I got a ton of performing experience. That was one thing. Fantastic. Fantastic. Early on. Two, I, I, um, because it was so hard to find training from male teachers, I went really broad. So I went deep into Chinese martial arts just to get physical training. Um, But I also went, into all these different ethnic dance, what what was called ethnic dance at the time, there were about 250 professional or quasi-professional performing groups in San Francisco at that time from all over the world. And it was just an extraordinary moment. And they all wanted men, they all wanted young men. And I I went around and I tried everything and everybody knew me, like I got in. Well, you, you hit at the right time and you were wanted. Yeah, and this opened the whole network for you. So you were you were in a vintage moment, it, right? And it hasn't repeat, didn't repeat. But no. um, but I I really got into to, to so um, you know the sort of Haitian tradition and the, at the Congolese tradition. But yeah, I also yeah. got into Indian classical dance uh, yeah. while I was still doing ballet and modern these other things that seemed to have a possibility. Uh, also, just Western the Western dance traditions. Yeah, like, see for me this well, makes you a wisdom of the body guy. You you basically you you studied the whole panorama. Uh, right. And it gave me this picture, right? Of yeah. Of, yeah. It, it gave me a, a capacity to see into the to the the Chinese realm. But uh, these other realms too, you know. For right. instance, my Indian dance teachers were they like Chitresh, he 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 grew up near a, a uh, um an army barracks. And yeah. you know his his father was big national figure in the dance world, um and and like so he grew up, all the dancers from all over the country were coming through his house like he was a major figure as a little kid so he learned a lot right and he was a prodigy right so but the army base was right there and he was just you know a rough angry kid so he would go and box those guys and he got beat up until he really learned boxing you know and um so. You know, that was like built in the, the teaching. He had a, this kind of what they call Tandava, which is which is the martial energy in Indian dance. It's the it's yeah. the, it's the masculine power. Yes. Um, and so, um, you know, I learned. I from him, I really got the sense that that was connected, but he didn't say, hey, these movements are for fighting. That I could just see because I was doing all the other stuff. I was doing it. was Chinese martial arts. I was like, you can fight with this, you know, you know, this movement. Yeah. <laughs> we have that in, in oh, yeah. You know, like, and, like Hawaiian dance. Yeah, Hawaiian dance or, is incredibly lethal. 
And some yeah. of the guys, they do know the application still. Yeah, yeah. And you see it, you yeah. see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. Um, mm. And yeah. and, uh, and most, yeah, I don't know. That's, for me, this is a very big issue. I, I actually got sidetracked. I knew I was leading into a really good question. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go, go back, circle back by, to that, whatever that was. <laughs> Let's see if I can remember what the question was. Um, because it's exciting to talk to you, by the way. I just want Thank to you. put that it's out. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. I liked your first book, and I thought, I like the way this guy thinks, because culture, you know, culture is uh, is part of the language. You don't have language and culture. Culture is part of the language. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's, yeah I, I mean, the, the, um, The big error that that academia is still making, mm -hmm. right, is um, is that they they've accepted this the framing of that came out of the that came out of the Guomindang mainly, you know, this that the that they had the chance to frame um, what Chinese culture was and like put Confucianism sort of on top and and then. And these were these were Methodists. You know, Chiang Kai Shek was a Methodist. He was absolutely. Oh yeah. There's, there's a huge. You see, part of part of that. I'll tell you who covers that. David Ross in his book on Chinese martial arts, a historical outline. Uh huh. He has a nice way of explaining these how ideology got involved, so mm -hmm. that. If, if because of the Boxer Rebellion and the Taiping Rebellion and some of these revolutions that involve martial arts guys, martial arts got lumped in with uh, radical revolution and uh, superstitious nonsense of being invulnerable through Qigong and all this kind of stuff, right? So because in the mind of Chinese of, of that last century, uh, history was often automatically connotatively linked to superstition and being irrational. They wanted to present themselves as advanced Western intellectuals who were progressive. Yeah. Yeah. And so that also involved being a Methodist. Right, right. And I use that. I'm now using that word Methodist um, as a translation for Fa Shi. So like um, uh, like a, a method master, which also meant Dharma master, you know, but yeah. the method masters as opposed to Taoists. Right. Yeah. Because someone who's yeah. a master of the method it, yeah. and, and which which very much, you know, the difference. Right. Is that it is that the Taoist view will connect everything together. Yes, the method master would say that the method is prior is the is preeminent. Yeah, um, and yeah. and another place this shows up like again a huge error I see in academia is, and I I hesitate to use this word but metaphysics, um, that the the academia is oh because because academia sees itself as not metaphysics you know that's the that's the theology department and we come from philosophy we are the science people over here you know and yeah. once like, again somebody that never painted with watercolor right and <laughs> and so they yeah. and so they say so 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 they, we have no metaphysics we can't talk about that right but mm. what they end up actually do is is inserting metaphysics where it isn't in order to debunk stuff or say we can't talk about that and that they actually have done that almost into the entire field of cultural studies like the entire realm of culture in i yeah. try to understand what china was <laughs> yeah. which is a yeah. way of understanding what it is but uh, yeah. understanding what it was um they've eliminated this sort of subject of religion because it's metaphysics when in actuality the chinese don't really have a lot of metaphysics if any in their religious it well, they, don't, they don't think yeah they don't think of it as metaphysical they think of you see the well the shaman's mind always views things as a uh, uh, gigantic uh, uh, a bus station right everything comes in and out somewhere 
like a roundhouse. It trains, you know, trains used to come into the roundhouse and go out to different places. They believe every you can find places where everything comes in and goes out. And uh, if you're standing at the right platform, you can get a train to anywhere. And the ancient mind really did believe that. And they would say, well, you could stand here and that's not going to happen. But if you stand over there, something fucking is going to happen to you. It's going to scare the shit out of you. So if you want to see what that's like, you got to go over there and stand there. It's right. very Carlos Castaneda in a way. Right. And you think, and you think, well, well, that's metaphysics. No, there's there's groundwater in five different springs, you know, 50 feet below that spot in the ground, and there's an electromagnetic pulse that the body is sensitive with, and they are not going to explain anything to you. They're just going to say, if you want to have the experience of the phenomenon, you go over there and you do that. They're not interested in debating metaphysics. Metaphysics is a theoretical construct. The ancient all the ancient cultures, they were not really interested in the construct. They wanted the experience. Why look at an apple when you can eat it? <laughs> you know, so our, our, our university, has, 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 they've got this incredibly remote way of dealing with material, which they mistook for objectivity. Right, right. No, that's, that's the problem. And, and I don't, I, it's, it doesn't seem to be going away. You know, I have a great example. There's, um, and which we should lead to the next question, mm -hmm. which is about meditation. So yeah. um, I teach Zouang or sitting and forgetting, right? Taoist yeah. meditation. And yeah. it's my view that the golden elixir arises from that uh, spontaneously. Mm. And that okay. it, it, because Zouang itself is a, uh, is a representation of the cosmology of the cosmos so what, what you're actually doing by practicing something non-conceptual, very similar to Zen, yeah, is is you're actually having an experience of how things come into being from Hun Tun, undifferentiated chaos, yeah. into differentiation and then right. back. Yeah. yeah. At, inside and outside of time, spontaneously, it, it, all sorts of ways, but that, that's right. the phenomenon. And this golden elixir thing arises, and what is it? Um and so I, I, because, because of that, I'm in the meditation world. And, and, uh, a few years ago, a, a student of mine who, who pioneered, uh, mindfulness in the schools mm -hmm. the program, um, said, Hey, you should look at this stuff that's going on over here. And this, this stuff, which is called Cheetah house. It's at Brown university. Um, okay. Cheetah is a joke on body, Bodhi Cheetah, but, um, okay. Cheetah, yeah. Cheetah as the animal yeah. is the name okay. of how it's spelled. And, Cute. and, it's a place for people who've had bad experiences with meditation. And it turns out, particularly if you're looking at um, people who go to retreats, there's a lot of people who have been hurt, uh, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. um, by meditation. And so she started this this woman over there who I believe is, I don't know, I might have this wrong. I believe she's a descendant of General Patton. But anyway, she's gone around. That's, that's rich. I know she's <laughs> gone around and interviewed like thousands of people who, yeah. who have had a, either teachers and but with dealing with bad students who had bad experiences and were both and cataloging yeah. this stuff. And yeah. she's a neurologist. So she's trying to link it to brain studies. But what she ended up creating, one of the things is 59. And I, my joke is it's actually 108, but 59 um, specific um, uh, meditation problems you know or i would say they're hell realms they're thing bad yeah. things that yeah. have gone wrong yeah. badly wrong yeah. you know uh -huh. and uh, and so i found this fascinating because i don't i think if you if you treat meditation as a healing method you there is a there are a lot of big risks especially if you say oh if you have that problem push through it whereas the training i got um, was to you know just always go the other way always go back towards simplicity like resolve that if you're if you're losing the concept of red lights you need to stop doing the no concept thing you've gone too far because uh, everybody something needs else. to know what a red light is something, something else is happening yeah you know that the vikings have a very old saying that they still use in denmark which is if you destroy a person's life lie they can fly apart in an explosion. Whoa. 
So, so that sometimes you have to, for this, you know, goodness over truth. And sometimes goodness has to be patient enough to let people hold on to their lies so they don't just explode when the veil is pulled back and they realize how much of what they carried in their head is pure fabrication. So working, you know, in your case, uh, on the meditation side, it's really important that you don't substitute one psycho complex for another. And so there's basic things like uh, let them figure out how to breathe. Don't tell them how to breathe. Um, you know, let them work into it. Be gradual, be kind. Let them try different approaches. A lot of these weird teachers, they're very, uh, speaking of Patton, they're very militant. If, well, and, if, this and is punishing. And it, it's like all the same problems. It's like, look, I'm trying to get over my abusive father. Well, what have you got? Well, I've got this meditation teacher that's just like my abusive father. Okay, well, let's see. Let's look at this. No, you got it. You nailed it. That's exactly what they say, by the way. Uh, you just, you, you, you intuitively knew it or you already knew it. Um, that, that, the, there's two categories of people who have, who, who are most likely to have these types of problems. One is young men who, who want to fast, take mushrooms and do, uh, you know, two weeks solid meditation with no food or whatever. Like those are the people that have problems, right? And the other type are uh, CEOs, you know, people who show up to the meditation retreat early and they have a psychological complex about following rules exactly. You know, this guy, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, but, yeah. But this isn't, this is, this is a side issue. I want to ask you what, um, what's the, for you, what's, yeah. what do you think historically, but also for you, what's the connection between meditation, all different types, whatever you've done, and martial arts? It's consciousness. Uh, so what I would say is uh, we have a mind. Okay, and the thing about a mind is it's a, a great servant and a terrible taskmaster. So what we have to do is uh, learn, learn to direct the mind because if we are not directing our mind, it is generally being directed by something we're not aware of, like Madison Avenue. So this question of the directed mind how you direct attention is, is the, the linchpin of martial arts and meditation is you're applying your mind to a target, uh, to a task. So whether you're sitting or moving, the mind is intending on achieving something, somehow changing its modality or position or state now the nice thing about the body is since there's sensory input you can position the body in different positions and the mind can have encounters with the body so that to me is really worthwhile especially for teenage initiation when you're starting to stink and your dick gets hard and the woman's getting curves and the young man's saying, who am I? What is happening to me? What is this? Uh, I'm not in control of a process. Uh, or, or as one teacher said, I'm not interested in what you've done. I'm interested in what's been done to you. Uh, so for me, martial arts is the application of the mind to function as a shaper of the body, okay, primarily. And then when that body collides or encounters other bodies, there is then another encounter of the mind through two bodies. All right. Now, in sitting meditation, the, uh, the encounter is with basically your own mental dialogue. So, you become your opponent. So there's a mirroring function mm -hmm. 
when you're doing martial arts, the body is the mirroring function or the enemy or the adversary or the training partner is the mirroring function uh, or the form or the rhythm of the dance or whatever you're trying to achieve with your body is the mirroring function. You try it, it mirrors back, you see what it feels like, you try it again. And you have this ongoing encounter of what am I feeling? How can I make it more this way? So a lot of people say that's getting to know yourself, but really it's just getting to know how your consciousness interplays with your body. We can debate if there's a self in there or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for now, for me, that's the main thing is martial arts is an application of consciousness. Meditation is an application of consciousness. Uh, meditation, the body can be dormant, but it's still one of the best ways to go into altered states. Like if you're sitting, if you just go into the crown and the tandian simultaneously and hold those two points in your mind while you're sitting there, that can be quite dynamic. So the body can be used in static meditation very effectively with the chakra system, whichever culture you come from. Uh, and But the body, I think, is uh, for a practical person who is a monkey by nature, it's better for them to get to their mind through their body. People who can't be still, they need to get into their body and, and they will get a lot of the benefits of meditation getting into their body. Uh, and I think of small children uh, in that respect as a teacher. Mm -hmm. They need to get in. They need to jump around. They don't need to sit still. That Their biological programming between two and ten is not about sitting still. And yeah, they can do it. But you know, I can also do a few things that I don't, I shouldn't be doing. I came to a question in my quest with the body, and you pro you may have come to this too in your own way, uh, Scott. And that is, what is it for? <laughs> and so, I, you remember, Kurt what's Vonnegut, the rotting flesh bag for? That sounds like a <laughs> that sounds like a Johnson Fung question. Yeah, yeah, and so when I. When I came back and said, well, I have this body, you know, what, what is it for? And I thought, look, that guy can jump around like a monkey. He can bench press four or 500 pounds. He can swing on a trapeze. He can do marvelous things with a sword. He can roll around. He can stand there and you can beat on him and he'll laugh. Uh, he's learned to suck his testicles up into his abdomen. He's learned to be the biggest dick, you know, whichever, whatever it is. People can do incredible things with their body. And so I thought, okay, that means that the body itself is really morphable. If you can train it to endure, you can train it to act like, you can train it to be like, emulate. And I thought, well, you know, it's easy for a person, for a human to put on the gestures of an ape, but it's very difficult for an ape to put on the gestures of a human being. And so I thought, in some ways, the human body is the only incomplete animal on the planet because we don't have a final form. We don't have a shell. We don't get horns. We don't get a final coat of fur, claws. Mm -hmm. We can't compete. So we're like a larval stage that never comes to full fruition. And so I thought, oh, well, I can't do anything with that. So maybe I should go back to infancy. Since I don't know what the body can become, what do I know the body has to do to get to where it? we call it an adult? Mm -hmm. Which we'll get into that in a minute. And so then I went, I found out all my martial arts training, all my traditional medicine training, uh, all the blah, blah, books, etc. I never really looked at what do children do when they roll out uh, the womb and get on the floor and start moving and exploring. And I thought that is the template we all have. Mm -hmm. And that is what we do by our nature. 
by what is programmed and what we do instinctively. Therefore, according to powers greater than I, which decided on this uh, pro or con creation or not evolutionary formation, these are the stages we all go through, right? So I got on the floor and I thought, okay, now I'm starting to get it. I understand the sun salutation as a baby lifting up his head in the, in the crib. And I understand one of the reasons staring at a pink sunset relaxes you is because when you're born, you're looking for that pink nipple, which will also relax you and bring you nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, okay. So there's a lot of archetypal things in infancy as we're evolving and our brain is just doing preliminary formation that tell us the secrets of meditation and of what the body is and what it can do and where we can go with it. Uh, and it describes a lot of things about our emotional settings, because I also begot, became interested in what is happiness uh, and how does that connect to the body? Because you can be the greatest martial arts expert or uh, strongman or sex exponent or whatever it is. You can be the greatest whatever and you're not happy in your body whatever you've accomplished with it. And so then I thought, well, there's, there's this happiness body thing. I want to look at that. And so that kept me on the floor laughing and rolling around as a child and looking for the, whatever that pretty thing smell or sound was. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those are meditation protocols and triggers when you get older or they're asanas or yoga postures. Or, you know, once you're at the standing speaking, it's martial arts and dancing. <clears throat> so so my feeling was to get back to what, what do we know for sure about the body. And that's when I created Wisdom of the Body, it essentially starts with the world of the senses and what the infant's encountering with a partially developed uh, optical system and a fully developed uh, audio system because that's fully developed in utero. Uh, and then noticing that the mouth, lips, teeth, and tongue, and jaw uh, basically reflect the emotional setting. Uh, and so I went from that up the scale. Uh, and then that confirmed a lot of other things in these elaborate historical practices. Right, right. Uh, so I, I got very interested in what I would call the primary archetypal triggers of the human body. Uh, how do we feel exaltation? You know, people try to cram it into a complex meditation, but there's a few simple triggers for that. Um, so, you know, the universal conversation is we all have a body and most of us don't really know what to do with it. And then it's rebranded and sold back to us as a solution. Uh, but we're not given the keys to the car. So I, I've gotten very interested in how do we drive our own car. And, and the ancients were interested in that. These are not new questions at all. No, I agree. Yeah. And they gave birth to a lot of phenomenal traditions. But if we're not looking for that, we won't get it. If you're trying to get your PhD and you're doing it on the vaginal vibrations of the female rabbit, that's not, it's going to get you the PhD and the social placement, but you'll still be missing the trick. You'll still be missing the triggers uh -huh. of what actually makes you happy. Yeah. So this quest, this odyssey, this quest this mythological journey, the Joseph Campbell soup thing, where you're going and you're getting all this stuff and having these encounters and enlightenment. I think there's a way that that can be viewed through primary uh, uh, glasses or primary switches as primary a Primary phenomena. So, or what actually the Chinese word is yuan, right? Is it, yeah, yeah, yuan. Yeah, yeah. Right. Going back or, to or the, origin. Or yeah, the footprint, your little baby footprint. You know, they used to take a footprint of the baby when he was born in ink. And uh, that's your that's your foot foot, that's your Tao. That's the footprint of the Tao. 
you just shine a light on it and that's the Tao Te Ching. That's that's that whoever's right before you, you know, who where did they go? Their constellation is in the footprint. Uh -huh. And yeah, so I I just released my translation of the Tao Te Ching, by the way. Oh, I'm looking forward to to, to getting a copy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's in uh, it, you can get it at Amazon. I uh, I did it as a, a kind of a lark, but I did it because Dr. Sasso told me that most people who are going to study Taoism really need to do their own personal translation. Yeah. And so I said, okay, because uh, he's kind of an advisor to me. He's mm -hmm. still alive. He's, I think he's 96 now. And um, so I started about a year ago while I was still in England doing some uh, archaeological research on King Arthur with my friend Mark Ollie, who's a really great archaeologist uh, and a drummer, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> Mark uh, and I were doing this, and it, I, it stung me that I needed to get busy on the translation. So on those cold English days, we weren't out on the <clears throat> Alderly Edge or something. I was uh, translating the Tao Te Ching, but I used uh, Star's translation for primary meaning. But then what I did is is I looked at the characters as, as primordial archetypes. So I cross-referenced what was academically acceptable with what I felt viscerally were the archetypes behind the words. And so I looked at them as, as mandalas, mm -hmm. as speaking mandalas. Mm -hmm. And so what you get is a sort of shaman's literalist approach <clears throat> uh, when you read it. You'll enjoy it. It's very different. I mean, it's that, not that, that, there's certainly... A precedent for that in china of look, looking at characters just yeah. staring at them and seeing what come you know what comes out of that oh, you know. That's or, 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 or doing the character a thousand times right and seeing what how it changes your body all of that it does. does it but does I, it does okay. we are we are a symbol system i Our you know i i i so I, I the way i teach meditation is i i say it's not a method it's a view I yeah mean, the only method is be still like I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't give any any meditation instruction other than that. But I teach what I do is I teach the Tao Te Ching, and yeah. so I've been going through it. Um, excellent. Um, That's an excellent myself, protocol because one, it's also it's, it's it also cycles. Yeah, and and it goes up and down in stairs stairways. Yeah, yeah. So you can't you can't go wrong. The the eighty one, you know that's that's nine octaves. I think there's, you know what? I think there's about six chapters in there that maybe somebody stuck on so they get the 81 number, but. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe because what I get from him is he also had a sides. He was teaching, there's some very systematic stuff. And then there's like, you know how an actor on stage will turn aside and say, hey, and he's talking to the audience yeah. and he has oh, yeah. that moment. Yeah, yeah. There's I, sometimes a different voice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that impresses me because it makes it very lively. But I found it incredibly warm. I found Lao Tzu to be incredibly warm and, and conversational mm -hmm. and earnest. I didn't find it to be cold, remote, uh, on a mountaintop. I really felt like I was just sitting in front of the fire with him. There's and, there's an enormous amount of humor in there, too. I, not as much as the Chuang Tzu, per se. Different right. style. But right. there is a lot of humor. and. It's mostly missed. The oh, you'll like it. Well, you'll like mine because I, I realized there's a lot of talk about the people in their flag and the folks. And basically, it's distributed between the people in their flag, go team, and the folks who are like the people, the fireside Taoists are going, oh, boy, here we go again, another revolution. You know, it's really funny uh -huh. to, to split humanity up like that. You're either a fireside dweller or you're waving a flag. And so you you got to decide, you know, what's worth your time. Uh, Fun. Um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure if, if you and if you have a link to that, I can put it with the video. Yeah, um, I don't have it, but they can look it up. It's called the um, the luminous footprint and the sacrificial virtue. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I hadn't even got my own copy yet. I think an author's copy is supposed to come this week. Uh, yeah, the luminous footprint and the sacrificial virtue. And uh, well, that's fun. That's going to be fun when you get it. 
All right, yeah. few more questions. How long have we been yeah. talking? Oh, it's pretty right. good. We're doing good. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> right, right. You can cut it into pieces. I've got time today, and I look forward to talking to you because it's, you know, it's peer, peer level conversation is always fun. Uh, Thank it's you. like when uh, when Sir Richard Burton, the explorer, met with. Uh, I might have been Stanley or Livingston, one or the other. They started comparing scars they got in Africa. <laughs> one said, you know, lion, and the other said, tiger, you know, pulled his pants <laughs> while marks on his ass. So it's kind of funny like that. Well, yeah. Exchange wound. Your, yeah. your description of, of, of the, you know, the, what meditation, meditation's relation to, to, to martial arts or to the body, really. Um, yeah. uh, I, I mostly put that in the, the category of golden elixir, one method of which is the one is the, well, you described more than one method, but is the method of, uh, you know, going to the source of what a human is, right. Which I would call the, the Dao Yin, or Dao Yin, yes. um, kind of method that, that you, that you're you're going back to the most primordial movement and taking it out into animals or into elements, right? So you get yeah. the, you get the the earth element, which is the yeah. fire, and the sure. wood, which is yeah. the smile and the ears uh -huh. up, you yeah. know, and the and the and you know the fire, which is a shock, you know, and the, yeah. and the it's um, all the elemental things are there. You remember Kurt Sachs when he wrote his book on dance history. Uh, it's an oldie. Uh -huh. um, he talked about how you danced your way into the presence of God. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and what's interesting is in most cultures, human beings could never appear as a human being in front of God. They had to dance around the fire or do a dance until they became an animal through dancing, which when it reached its fever pitch, was then in a purified state to encounter God. And that was the ecstatic moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could say you dance until you're so tired, the ego slides off and you become yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and uh, there's not been many representations in ancient culture of the human face. Usually the human has to become an animal to get to the divine which is kind of like C.S. Lewis saying to be a good Christian, you have to be a good pagan first. Uh, <laughs> and that's a sort of acknowledgement of the body, right? That you really got to be fully embodied. The animal, the elephant in the meditation mandala, you got to feed him, cup his horns, walk him up the terraces, train him. And then after a while he's safe. And then that little monkey pops up on his back, you know, intelligence. And wow. so we we have this thing with our body that it has to be trained and uh, the mind is trained with the body, you know, because we have it. That's our that's our encounter point. So the Taoist idea of uh, Yuan or origin, there's also this um, this idea of birthing of when the baby emerges and rotates out of the mother. Mm -hmm. Spirals out, yeah. You know, the animals don't spiral. They pop out. So they face away from the mother. <clears throat> and we rotate, and the mother scoops us up, and we begin this face-reading business. Uh -huh. And she coos and smiles and holds our facial muscles like that. Mm -hmm. And we get our faces cradled and she's waiting for that day when there's this incredible recognition, when the baby can focus on her eyes and she knows she's seen and she smiles and the baby smiles back. Mm -hmm. So we also have this, as you said, with the elements coming through the face, we're, we're built for facial reading. We're face readers. Mm -hmm. Facial recognition is kind of the technical term. We're facial readers in the animated sense. The ripples of movement and the glow of the face is what we actually read. Uh, and that's buffered by technology. So that's why sometimes you do need to meet someone face to face. And you'll say, wow, they're really different than I thought they were. 
uh, you know, something's, something's you, imminent. You know, a, a friend of a dancer friend of mine said, you know, in this particular era, if you want people to be when you're dancing and you want people to actually see the dance, yeah. you need to wear a wig or a mask because otherwise people are just face <laughs> controlled. They'll only be looking at your face. Well, you know, the mask dances are so weird and haunting. Any any culture, just cover the face. If you just put a blank there and the body begins to go. Yeah. I did mime. I did the crew mime when I was 18 with a private teacher. So I learned my muscular isolations and stuff when I was young and did white face, which is another way of, of doing, of, you know, covering the some of the reading. Yeah, there are many ways to do it. There are many other tricks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So... Yeah, the meditation movement thing, it links. And it's, to me, all about the movement of consciousness, how we move our intention. Mm -hmm. And the core element of that, to me, is knowing, first off, that you can do, you have the inner freedom to direct your attention. And... You know, if if you're upset, think of your feet. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just direct your attention. And people don't, as a rule, have sufficient education in mind mm -hmm. to realize that they don't need to be a victim of their attention. Mm -hmm. Because the operations of media, social media, mass media... Uh, is to direct your attention to concepts and things which remove you from that yuan, that original point, to get you caught up in something, you know, how real it is, it's debatable, you know. You know, this 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 sort of raises a the question that there the the modern internet um uh of intellectuals seems to think there's a crisis in meaning. Um and and they're like, how do we how do we fix the crisis in meaning? You know, you see this stuff. You also see in um, particularly the Tibetan Buddhist realm, uh, some of the smarter people there talking about the dangers of nihilism. Um, uh, that that certain types of meditation can if, if you just end up being kind of nihilistic. Yeah. Um, and my my answer to that is, you know that really nihilism is just what happens when you smoke too many cigarettes and drink too much wine. It's just the next morning you're a nihilist. It's not, it's just a, just a, a body state that you can easily get yeah. out of. Well, that's true. It can, and, it can it, certainly be instigated by that kind of thing. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. And, and the meaning, um, meaning uh, the, the Taoist view doesn't have, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't ever land you in a meaning crisis because the Nate, because the, the practice is that meaning you can go into it and it gets more microscopic, you know, it gets more and more detailed, more and more that whatever the thing was you're looking at becomes, becomes, you know, forces yeah. in the, in the micro sphere yeah. or, whatever. or you can right. go out of it and it merges with it. It, it, it it merges in with chaos eventually going toward Tao, which we don't get the direct experience of, but right, right. We we it goes after chaos. So and you just come back and it's different. Um and if it's if it's exactly the same as last time, just go again. You know, like you can go into it and back to it, or you can go out. That 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 in a sense, I'm describing what you described that you could move your attention somewhere, but I'm saying you could change the scale of your view as well yeah, that's that's the key you know hanuman he could make himself tiny and then he could make himself gigantic yeah. and yeah. any any standard meditation protocol a lot of times the deity practice you make yourself gigantic mm -hmm. uh yeah just just to to be sure uh that you can fulfill that indulgence uh and get it out of the way Okay, you know, if you want to be king or God, well, go do it. Imagine you're king or God. Now what are you going to do? No, no, do it right. Do it for about three hours, you know, uh, and then come back. So the free movement 
of the imagination is extremely important to not be victimized by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, be great, be tiny, be insignificant. Okay, if you can be nihilist, can you be the opposite? That would be the, yeah, the you know, goodest challenge is, okay, be nihilist. Now be uh, everything is real and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, omnipotent or, yeah, or just, you know, yeah. Play, yeah, yeah. play with your concept. Ultra clarity, yeah. All the, 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 um, the academics, the crisis uh, in meaning is, uh, is actually, to me, a crisis in language. And it's because we we went away from popular academia uh, fell for this idea that language doesn't have spirits behind it. If language, you see, it doesn't have spirits behind it, if it doesn't have something living emanating, then basically it's just the handle of a suitcase. So what happened was they decided that language was strictly symbols pointing to other symbols and was entirely relative. <clears throat> so that's the Joseph Campbell soup. Well, this is symbol and this is a symbol and we're all in symbols. And over time, these symbols change. <clears throat> well, the problem is, <clears throat> There's apparently a program with language. And we know that because of cave paintings. And we know that because of the history of poetry. There's a recurring, there's a common vocabulary of 12 reoccurring symbols. And they morph, but they're the same symbols and we can track them through history. Now, this indicates there's something that appears to be a genetic program. Something that is in our substance that reoccurs and morphs and evolves, but is standing behind all we do and say. And because of that, <clears throat> we can develop a vocabulary that is uh, consistent <clears throat> and not relative. And this is not taught uh, in academic in the academic world because language has been denuded of meaning so the idea of the sacred word has been made laughable and yet we still know <clears throat> if you get a saxophone and you put a little tray of sand on the horn end and you play notes that sand will jump into patterns according to the notes you play mm -hmm. so we know that sound has the power to shape matter and it is not relative it is strictly by law of geometry and tone there's nothing relative about it only a certain sound will give you a certain shape and so language has this eternal element related to sound in it mm -hmm. now when it goes to the written form things obviously get juxtapositioned you end up with hieroglyphics or alphabets so that's another that's another tirade we could go on. Mm -hmm. But I'm very interested in these eternal sounds in us because they bubble up and then our bodies have a form. And anybody who wants to look at that can look at cymatics. Look at the films on YouTube of cymatics and, and look at Hans Jenny uh, and his old films of cymatics and how sounds affect fluid shape. And then realize that in a gravitational field, that shape will be different than it would be in outer space. Because part of the reason for the space station is to manufacture things in outer space that can be formed and that can't be formed under gravity. One of those being a perfect BB that has no resistance, uh, perfect sphere, ball bearings. Uh, so there's there's things. So I, I think that that we used to the make them by dropping them from high towers, by the way. Yeah, I used to teach by one of those towers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That was near the, the studio I had many years ago. But um, so I think the crisis, the meaning is still there. The meaning hasn't disappeared. The crisis is in what they've done to reduce meaning. 
or to extract meaning by trivializing language. And that to me would be like tri trivializing dance. Dance is language. Dance is a form of hieroglyphic language. Uh, it's three dimensional, it's animated, it's a living, living language. Uh, you know, there's a, the, the, uh, the guy who wrote Dance We Must, have you, you ever read no, that? But, I, but I, when I would just say some, some of the things you can say with your body are too shocking to actually translate back into words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right about that. Let me just pull. Have I got a copy? Here it is. You should have this in your library. Which? What's the book? It's the guy that inspired Gene Kelly. Uh huh. Ted oh, Sean. Ted Sean. Oh yeah, of course, Ted Sean. Yeah. yeah. You know, I haven't read that. I would like to. Um, it is. But uh, Ted Sean was a Buddhist, you know. I'm not surprised. Well, a lot of times his uh, his assistant, um, the lady that worked with him, what was her name? Um, Ruth St. Dennis. Yeah, she she did a lot of Asian uh, themes. You you know you know the backstory. So I you can listen to some of um, yeah I know I I have to get that book. You're right. Um, but you you can listen to some of my interviews with um, Joseph Hasiel, um, yeah, who. Uh, you know, who interviewed me, he read my books. He was like, he was just a huge enthusiast. And then, you know, yeah. and he's, he's, he's actually just put out his own book on Buddhism and dance. Um, but uh, he had, he did a big research project on Ted Sean. So I, there's a whole bunch of us discussing him. Um, but one of the things I, I found out, cause it, that sent me on my own, on my own uh, wormhole that, um, that, you know, the, the Dennis Sean company, right? Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean traveled all over the world and yeah. they had with them, they had all the major modern dancers. They had, um, they had Charles Weidman, they had um, uh, Martha Graham, they had um, uh, Doris Humphrey and mm -hmm. others that were in that company. You know what yeah. they did when they got on the bus? They read Nietzsche out loud. They were sitting there reading Nietzsche out loud. They all were Nietzsche masters. And Martha Graham actually said, I owe it all to Nietzsche. And you see a lot of people talk about Nietzsche and they've turned him into a cartoon. They don't realize that he said a lot of incredible stuff. He was a dancer. Oh. He, he, was, he, oh. he, he wasn't a dancer. He, he, he inspired, or he inspired Isidore Duncan. Yeah. She said she oh, was. Nietzsche was a, a major thinker and, mm -hmm. uh, and feeler. People don't realize that, uh, you can lose it in the end, but that doesn't discount the rest of your life. Yeah. So, so, so let yeah. me let me let me take a little bit. Fascinating about Nietzsche, though. I'm going to keep that in mind. That <laughs> brings a very interesting set of colors to the equation. It does. You yeah. you what you described there. You know, well, part of what you described there of the the, the twelve symbols, and you know, this this is. Uh, Jung, Carl Jung said, right, that that uh, essentially said that there's a genetic basis for the for the collective Period. conscious. And so you kind of like wove that in there. I just oh. want to put that out. Yeah, um, definitely. I what are these 12 symbols? Are 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 they abstract or can I look at them? Are they three dimensional? Yeah, <clears throat> get a copy of uh, uh, Destiny and Human Control Systems by Charles Muses. Uh, I knew Charles Muses briefly before he passed. We corresponded a few times and I had done his harmonic training for about 10 years. <clears throat> and he was a brilliant Renaissance guy, uh, fell in love with uh, Egypt among other things <laughs> and was a Sufi. Uh, but I was sent to Charles Muses to do his harmonic training by uh, my wrestling teacher, who was also a Sufi. Um, and so Muses wrote this book, which has something in it for everybody. But he's got a chart of the symbols in the back. But they're basically the symbols you're familiar with from old cave painting. 
spirals, grids, triangles, ovals. Mm -hmm. And they are what you will see if you do sun training with your eye and you press on it, you compress the optic nerve and you see geometric shapes. They're part of the default structure of the nervous system. So everyone has them. Mm -hmm. And so we don't look at the world with rose colored glasses. We look at it through 12 different shapes. That uh, that's a great, great uh, answer. And, and, I'm, I, and I bet people listening to this will follow up on some of that stuff. That, that's oh, really it's fantastic stuff. Now you can reduce the 12 to 8. That's the Bagua. Uh -huh. But the Bagua is very peculiar because Bagua is interested in how it's interested in the moment when one thing is beginning to mutate into another. That's where Bagua really has something is this model of weaving. How cross, how the transverse and cross threads begin to interweave. The, the point of mor morphosis is what Bagua is interested in as a concept. Uh -huh. As a martial art, uh, yes. I think it came with the antler knives and the crescent knives from India in the Song Dynasty. And the, the primary choreography hinges on a tool you hold in your hands, which is a hooking and pulling tool. It's essentially a modified set of uh, small antlers. All right, well, hang on, hang on. I'm going to send you my book. Yeah. You're going to get my take, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss this, because I you clearly... I uh, have thought about it a lot and you're probably going to look at some of my stuff and go, no way. And other stuff you're going to be like, what? That's crazy. You know, or whatever. So well, I would like to get your full take on that. But all right, let me, let me just say this. There's always two streams. One is the conceptual yeah. and imaginary. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also the tool aspect, the hard tool aspect. You hold yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. And, and these can override and people will say, well, you got to learn to stay alive. You got to learn to fight to do your ritual. Yeah. But no, the human mind is not made like that. Uh, the human We're made to function on inspiration, whether we can fight or not. So the exis our existential dilemma, can I survive, yeah. and our ability to experience beauty are very, very close. And this is where you and I have a sort of tacit agreement of how powerful that relationship is between the existential and the imaginary. And uh, we'll need to pull Owen Barfield out for his evolution of poetry on that one. Uh, yeah. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And and I, I'm, I'm going to end, not because I want to stop, but because <laughs> I'm trying to make the conversation something people can just sit down or whatever and listen to. It's fun. Um, we did a lot of different. We we traversed quite a lot of turf. I have I have a final question for you. Yeah. Which, which I which is which I which is two questions. I'll give you a choice. Okay. Uh, one biggest mistake you've made in on this journey, or the biggest reversal. Oh, that's really interesting. Um. Huh. You said mistake, and what was the other one? The reversal. Because sometimes I think my biggest mistakes is that I was going this way, and I should have been going this way, you know. Oh, no, I don't feel any mistake as far as direction. Mm -hmm. My direction has always been uh, or Orphean. How, how do you reassemble something broken? That's always been my direction. How do we put Orpheus back together after he's been ripped by the fierce fairies in the underworld. Uh, that's always been my direction on an archetypal level. Uh, biggest mistake? God, it's hard. There have been so many. Uh -huh. um, I, I would say um, probably at 30, is your Saturn return astrologically. And you have an opportunity to make a life changing decision. And that's usually the time when you should use your springboard. And uh, I was a loyalist and I, I worked with Robert Smith from 30 to 40. And I, had I left him at 30, 
I think I would have been 10 years ahead of myself now. Uh -huh. So I think that displaced loyalty is one of my biggest mistakes mm -hmm. and holding myself back through loyalty to an authority figure, however good or bad they are. Mm -hmm. So that, that I would say <clears throat> misplaced loyalty is probably my biggest mistake. And that's something that you can't change because it's, it's got a chronological tether. I believe life has very particular windows mm -hmm. and, and once the time has passed, you've you're it's gone mm -hmm. you were in a vintage dance rosetta stone cacophony for a period of time yeah and and you got your your feet dipped in immortality right right <laughs> and, and it, it won't occur again yeah. so you were at the right place at the right time you yeah. were not at the bus station when your ship came in so right. my thing is uh there are places i wished i had been earlier uh -huh. And uh, I, I wished I could have done it earlier or had the discrimination. And I would I would have been better striking off on my own 10 years earlier. At least that's what I think. <laughs> Maybe the fates are smarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a that's a that's a good one. That the the the. Uh, the nature of time, you know, and what's what's the right time to leave? Boy. It's a tough one, isn't it? I I know, and and if you're working with traditions, there's you're also working with entities, spirits, and attitudes, and things that have been around for millennia. Mm -hmm. So, this brings up the quote metaphysical or supernatural, which we could also you and I could say these are very strong genetic programs that we have to tackle. We have to wrestle them. There's no there's no escape. They're present. They're in us. They're, they're, it's a built-in thing. You know? Yeah, I'm only interested in metaphysics if I can wrestle with it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, the Jacob model. That's it. <laughs> Jacob wrestled with the angel. You know. That's I, that's where I am with that. I'm with you 100. percent Well, let me let me officially end this talk, and we can chat a little bit afterwards. Um, thank you so much, uh, Robert yeah. Allen Pittman, for for this You're interview. You're welcome. And Thanks let's do it again. Um, that's it. Yeah. All right. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book, Tai Chi Bagua Zhang and the Golden Elixir: Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at NorthStarMartialArts.com. Thanks.